Good morning, church. Really happy to be here. We're celebrating confirmation and also Mother's Day. And uh, so joyful, I think, for a parent to see their kid following Jesus and saying yes to Jesus. Uh, we have a long scripture today, um, so I'm going to just dive into it. I'm going to do the first part, and then Zoe is going to do the second part. It is in Numbers 22, 1 to 19. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along this, the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all the Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this whore is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to Simon Balaam, son of Beor, and was at Peter, near the Euphrates River, in his native land. Balak said, a, a people has come out of Egypt. They covered the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabites officials stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Bala, son of Zippor, king of Moab, send me this message. A people that had come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I'll be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, Go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let go with you. So the Moabites officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other officials, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, This is what Balak, son of the poor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely. And do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them. Even if Balaam gave me all the silver and gold in his plate, I could not do anything great or small that go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now spend the night here so that I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. And I will be reading the second part, Numbers 22, 20 through 33. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road and into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. 
The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opens Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would have certainly killed you by now, but I would have spared it. And now I ask you to join me as we do our prayer for the pastor. Lord, I am so thankful for the wonderful opportunity that is today's confirmation service at this, this large group of demote, devoted and influenced students prepares to come even closer with God. I pray that our pastor uses his words and messages to bring them into their next step and prepare them for all the wonderful things that will take part in this. I hope his message shows the congregation the powers and faith of the church's youth and how they are growing with us as we grow with them. And I overall hope that the message and words we hear today give us hope and faith in the future. Amen. Well, I'm going to join with all my colleagues and say good morning, good morning. and happy Mother's Day to all of you that are moms. Um, it's a great honor, I think, for many of you to be uh, mothers. My mother's here today, and I'm grateful to have a good mother that raised me well, um, <clears throat> she raised me well. I just didn't receive it all, so that's, you know, how that goes. And, you know, and I encourage you and those of you that are joining us on the church online um, to remind yourselves that as you pray that for some people it's been a struggle for them to be and is a struggle for them to be uh, a mother that builds in good values and, and uh, um, you know, that n nourishes their kids' spiritual lives. So be praying for those because it's a journey and, and a hardship for them. And we can wrap our arms around them in love and, and God's support as well. So I, I do say happy mothers to all of you that are part of this church and the church online. Also, I've received a couple of questions from the church online that I want to I answer um, because you asked. Um, so when we're here in church, we don't pass the offering plates anymore. We have these things called joy boxes, and they look kind of like this. Um, uh, what you see on your screen, but since you're not here, now if you're here, you can go to them. Uh, wait for a few minutes if you would. Um, I mean, if you're dying to give your offering, go, but, and don't forget, but um, if you're not here, um, the, it's, it's a little bit uh, different to give, uh, but I want to show you this. We, we have online giving, and you can go to marionmethodist.org, and um, our great, my, I'm grateful our staff has circled the giving line. It's always up there, and here's the thing I want to tell those of you that are, I'm going to look straight at, at you on the church online. Since you reached out to me to a comp through a computer, that's how you do it. If you can't find it through that, just go to the bottom of the website. There's an address. Put a bunch of dollar bills, send it an envelope. No, I mean, just send them to the church. But thank you for asking. Um, we appreciate that you want to be part of us through your gifts as well as that is one of the marks of a disciple. So um, we start every, every one of these um, Sundays during our Miracles Believing the Hard to Believe series. We've started with a little miracle quiz. All right? So... Um, I, I'm not going to, Riley, I'm not going to make you answer these questions, all right? But you'll know the answer, right? So here's the first question. Um, though Balaam is a sorcerer, uh, more page print is given to him in the Bible than Mary, the mother of Jesus, Lazarus, Mary and Martha, or all of the above. What do you think, Rachel? Should I bring you up here and you have answered it? No, you're good, okay? Congregation, what do you think? Which one? D is the correct answer. All of the above. Milo, I know you want this answer, so I'm not even going to really ask the rest of the congregation. I'll just ask you. Um, how many members of the Bible, in the, in the Bible, uh, how many members of the animal kingdom speak in the Bible? One, two, four, or seven? You can answer out loud if you think you got it. You're good? All right. What do you guys, what do you guys think? How many? Two. Two. Who said seven? That's good. Back to Bible study for you. All right. Last question. This is a fill in the blank. What other animal speaks in the Bible? Snake. The snake, the serpent or the snake of God. So good job. All right, so your quiz has been taken. Um, I know the confirmation students probably would have scored somewhere between zero and 100. Um, they do that, you know. 
But I want to tell those of you that have gathered here or as, uh, online, um, on my confirmation Sunday, confirmation is a pretty big deal for me. You know, I'm, one of my favorite things of every single week is to spend uh, my Wednesday afternoon with these 10 and the other 18 that were confirmed at the earlier service. Um, you know, really growing their faith, really uh, challenging me sometimes, um, and, and I'm grateful for the teachers that have led them this year. And so when I give my talk today, I give it to the 28, to the confirmation students. It's the truth for you too, and I invite you to listen in. I invite you to act and live out this faith, but I'm gonna deliver it right straight to them. So all of you, but especially since you guys might be in it, pay attention uh, and act on your faith. And by the way, give them a hand for memorizing their lines, right? All right. So what happened? That's our first question. We've been asking three questions in this series about every single miracle. What happened in the story? So let's go through it quickly because we want to confirm these students and be at lunch before afternoon. So King Balak hires a sorcerer to curse the new neighbors. Who would have thought that one of the main characters in a biblical story that has several pages written about him would be a sorcerer? Now, Balaam is a sorcerer. And the problem is, to King Balak, that the Israelites are doing what people are so effective in doing, making more people. And so they're growing like crazy. And not only are there becoming more and more Israelites, and they're right next door to him, but every time the Israelites go into a battle against one of the other kingdoms nearby, they absolutely rout their opponents because they go with, with the way of God. And so Balaam is famous for calling down curses on some king's opposing army. And, and he's actually just amazingly accurate. I mean, we don't believe in sorcery. So what he's really doing is predicting what will happen. And, and he takes a lot of money. That's why he says he gets a divination fee. He gets a lot of money for making these curses. And his predictions are almost always accurate. So God speaks to Balaam, directing him only to do what God was told him to do. And you know why, right, Marin? I mean, you know why, why he does this. It's because um, he's, Balaam is shocked because um, he's not a Christian. He's not a Jewish person. He, he's a pagan guy. And so when God starts speaking to him, he really listens because he's like, wow, this is like super new, and so he doesn't go at first. He, he tells the, is, the, the Moabites, now keep your money. I'm good for now. But then as the night goes on, he, he goes anyway. Now, I want to explain something. It's not just to you, Haley. This is for everybody, okay? I'm looking at you, freaking you out, and you hate this part of it, right? That's the best smile ever. <laughs> but I want to tell you why Balaam is able to do the wrong thing because it's really important for all of us to know this. It's called in, in Christian terms the permissive will of God. We can know the very exact right thing we're supposed to do. We can understand the scriptures correctly and exactly and we still are given privilege by God to do the wrong thing if we choose to. That doesn't make it right. It means we have to repent. We have to come back to God. But God does not want robots. He wants people that are obedient and faithful because they want to be. And, and, and you need to hear that because the caution is in your, your young adult life, and you know this cadence, is, you're, is you raise up through middle school and high school, you're gonna give the, be given the option to do whatever you want. And, and, and it's important for us to find our way into God's will. So what happens in the story is that, that when, when, when Balaam goes the wrong way, God blocks Balaam's progress. He, he won't let him continue to go the, the same way. And you know, the donkey, uh, the donkey sees the angel. Balaam doesn't. So first the don donkey goes out into a, to a field. Balaam beats him. He goes back on the thing. And then the donkey pushes his owner's foot against the wall. And the donkey beat, he gets beaten again. And then the donkey w goes out into a field the third time. And Balaam just beats and beats and beats. You know how you do, Will, right? You beat your donkey. Do you beat your donkey a lot? Thank you. Good, good job not beating your donkey. And Balaam says, if I had a sword, it's donkey sandwiches tonight, right? No, we never had a donkey sandwich. All right. But here's what's happening. After he beats this donkey, all of a sudden this donkey has something to say. 
the donkey starts talking to Balaam. God causes the donkey to have a voice. Now, it's doubtful that this donkey had reasoning power. Yet he and Balaam have a conversation. Now, you think, Ryan, they'd had a conversation before? I'm not thinking so, right? Otherwise, Balaam would say, well, like we were saying earlier, right? But he doesn't. Balaam's like kind of surprised, but yet he still has this conversation with him. And it keeps going. And what we know here is that, that the conversation is what opens Balaam's eyes to this angel that is there that's going to threaten and take Balaam's life. And what's interesting is when the angel starts to speak, he asks the same exact question that, that the donkey does. And, you know, Tanner, you know what that means, right? That means that God is giving both the angel and the donkey the message. They, they're, they're both saying the exact same question, which would show us that God is causing both of them to speak. And so Balaam falls on his face and begins to worship. And Balaam then, instead of cursing Israel, blesses Israel, which is exactly what King Balak, who paid him the money, asked him not to do. It's the exact opposite. So that's what happened. Why did it happen? Well, it went to show, it, it, it happens to show that God can use anyone to do his will and speak his truth, and that God provides us signs of his activity. God always gives us these nudges. God always puts people out in front of us. God gives us circumstances. Some of you call them coincidences or maybe even luck. But he gives us these things to help us see God's activity. See, if the donkey had just stopped, right? I, I mean, you know this, Declan. If the donkey would have just stopped, you'd have said, I mean, you might have been there. Maybe you say this to your donkey. You might have said, well, that's just what donkeys do. They're stubborn. But the donkey doesn't just stop. That is what donkeys do, and you, you have to pull them to get moved, and that's what my confirmation friends tell me because I don't have a donkey, but <clears throat> they assume, you would have assumed natural stubbornness, but instead, this donkey takes Balaam on a ride out into the field up against the wall, sits down on him. He's trying to show Balaam that something unusual is happening, and even in the conversation, he says, have I ever done any of this stuff to you before? I, I never do this stuff to you. And Balaam says, answering his donkey, no, you don't. So why it happened is to remind us to look for God's activity, guys, gals. Look for God's activity everywhere. So now why are Christians to believe it? The talking donkey tells us that God knows how to be heard. So if you hear God, you've kind of moved into donkey status, right? God shows us that, that he, he, can, he, he, he knows how to be heard. And so what is preventing you, and I'm talking now to all y'all, what is preventing you from hearing God's message to you? I gotta tell you a secret. Th those of you guys in the front row, I gotta tell you a secret. You know what's preventing us from hearing God's words most of the time? Usually it's us. Usually it's our own self our own thoughts, our own minds, our own opinions that keep us from hearing what God wants us to hear. That doesn't mean that God's not continually sharing that message. It doesn't mean that God's not continually putting it out. But I do want to tell you, and your parents can tell you this true, your grandparents, some of them are here today. Some of your uncles and aunts can tell you, we miss God's voice regularly. Not because God's not speaking. It's just because we're not in tune to that voice the way we should. And, and I know that, that when we miss God's voice regularly, we might say, well, I hear a bunch of stuff, Pastor Mike, but how do I know that it's God's word? How do I know that it's that voice? I mean, Riley said a few minutes ago that Scripture is a primary source of our faith. That's how we figure out what God is to say to us. So the question is, are you becoming an expert listener? Some of you are going to get, well, all of you are going to get a Bible today, but some of you have, have books, Bibles that you like to open and, and read. Some of you have your iPhone or whatever, your Samsung, where you, where you read the YouVersion Bible on there. No matter how you do it, you become an expert listener by knowing the kind of things God says. By, by, by meditating on the word of God, by reading it and saying, what does it say here? So then you know what God, the kind of things God says. So when you hear something, you can test that against what you already know that God has said. You can listen to it and put it against that matrix. So why are Christians to believe it? 
If God can use a donkey, he can use you. God has a use for every one of you. It doesn't matter if you're in seventh and eighth grade. It doesn't matter if you're 70 or 80. As long as we're breathing, God has a use and a purpose for every single one of us. Now, what I've learned throughout the years, and this is important, those of you guys that have been through a year worth of discipleship training, here's what I can tell you for sure. Successful disciples focus on what they have, not what they don't have. They try to use the gifts that God has given them in the circumstances that they're in, not try to concoct or find some other thing. You've been trained. This whole year, from September, whatever it was, the 15th of September until May 14th, you've been coming on every Sunday morning. Like we said, when's class? Every time it's Sunday. So you had class every Sunday morning, and you had a lot of Wednesday afternoons and other activities with me, and you've been trained and encouraged to live the marks of a disciple. And those marks are five things, and, and you know them all, because I had interviews with you, and you told me, you know, we, we have the mark of a disciple that, that's, that we call prayers. Prayers is when we speak and listen to God. So make sure you speak, but make sure you listen. We, 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 we are a disciple when we're present for God and God's people. All of you have told me at some level or another that you loved coming to your confirmation group and that you liked somebody in your group. I gotta tell you, though, you guys right here in the front row, I really did Cadence a disservice. One girl, four boys. God bless you, Cadence. She has to be student of the year almost, right? And it's not just four boys, it's these four. <laughs> and they're all awesome, I'm just kidding. But, but you have to be present for each other. There's times where your friends just need you, and there's times when you need them, and you can't do anything about it unless you're present for them. And we give our gifts, we joyfully, I, you know, I was talking to the church online a few moments ago, but when we give our gifts, we give them joyfully, we offer God our resources. We don't have lambs to sacrifice anymore, so, so we give something that represents ourselves to God. And I know one of you guys were talking to me earlier this week about how your favorite day in confirmation was the day we gave our witness to each other. When we gave our testimonies, we told our stories. And I even asked you some of the things that you remembered about that. And there were some amazing stories in the faith of these people that are seated here in the front row. And I know there's some amazing stories out there in your faith. And I encourage every single disciple, we, the only way this faith grows, Christianity grows in the world, is by communication. We share what God has done with and for us. Uh, and, and that's how more Christians are made. And of course, and I gotta tell you, parents, when, when I, you know, these students have heard for the last three years, anytime they've been paying attention, you know, in church, that we have these five marks of disciple, prayers, presence, gifts, witness, service, and probably half of them, when they were listing them off to me, started with service. They understand the importance of serving God through serving other human pe people. They, they understand that loving your neighbor means doing something about that love, sometimes tangibly with your hands, sometimes in helping kids, other students or something with bullies and that sort of thing, but you guys get it. And while we're supposed to act on the marks of disciples, understand that God is not helpless without us. He knows that our best life is with him. And so now you've come to this moment because all this is about your choosing. The 10 of you, plus Presley, who was, was confirmed earlier, that, that's in this group here, claiming your Christian faith. I know that some of you got drugged here on Sunday morning. You, you know how you felt Sunday morning after you'd been up playing video games or with your friends the night before and you're all tired and you're like, I'm so tired. Remember how you feel that? Your teachers feel like that all day long, so get over it, Okay. But you guys came and you learned and you had discussions and you did activities. And, and, and like I said, my favorite afternoons are always Wednesday afternoons with you. And all of that was about moving your faith from I have to go to church to my parents make me go to I want to be a Christian for myself. I choose to be a Christian. I, I on purpose. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I trust my salvation to him and him alone. I place my life in his hands and his alone. Will you still have to use your brain? Yes, of course. Will you still have to use your body? Yes. Will you have to be willing in this world to be used by God? Absolutely. But that's what this is all about. This isn't about the fact that you guys can, you're all smart, so I never even worried about whether you could say your lines. It wasn't about the fact that you'll get some loot or something like that from your parents, and even on Mother's Day, they're gonna celebrate you. Can you imagine? It's not about that. 
It's all about you joining other Christians, the several billion of us in the world that are Christians, on this great mission of Jesus Christ in the world and with this church as well. So let's go. Let's get you guys confirmed. Amen.